Welcome to the Commerce Talks podcast here in Dubai. So uh, we're going to talk about like the e-commerce ecosystem um, here and how it's evolving, um, obviously. Um, but I'd like to start with your uh, past. Uh, you were in touch with the German ecosystem quite heavily uh, when you started your e-com career with uh, Rocket. Can you um, uh, elaborate a bit on that first Alex, journey? Thank you very much for having me, first of all. Yes, my journey started with Rocket late 2010, early 2011 uh, at the Iconic in Australia. Then I stayed with Rocket for the next six, seven years uh, from Australia to Germany in Berlin and uh, looked through about uh, seven to eight of the companies that we launched across, I think, 45 countries at a certain point. Um, it, was, it was a great experience. I mean, that was the heydays of Rocket, right? Uh, 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 we had most of the, the large organizations that still runs from Delivery Heroes to HelloFresh to the Lazada, um, the Jumia Group, and uh, the Global Fashion Group and everything else. Uh, it's, it's good to see how they're going strong. But I think most importantly to see a lot of the guys from Rocket days are also now around in uh, all the different ventures like we were discussing earlier. And I think that's also great to see as well. Yeah, and you, it, it wasn't only the heydays within the Rocket uh, universe. It was also the heydays in, uh, in the e-com industry because uh, we have seen many new business models um, starting every week, more or less. So one product a day, models like Wood.com. Groupon was like, I think, the big peak in 2010, 2011. I, I don't remember um, 100%. And everybody thought, okay, now it's really going on. The e-commerce uh, market share will grow everywhere. Uh, uh, beyond the level of like 20, 30, whatever percent. Now you're here in the Middle Eastern region. So how heyday-like does it feel here when it comes to e-commerce? Like this is my fourth year in the uh, Middle East now. And uh, from 2018, 2019 till 2022 now, and uh, the transition has been tremendous. I mean, of course, COVID helped in, in, in the middle. And uh, just like anywhere else, any other part of the world, COVID accelerated. But I believe that that has been the ambition for Middle East within many large organizations to small startups. There has been that ambition. COVID definitely helped to accelerate that and rapidly digitize existing organization to new companies as well. Okay, let's start maybe with your consumer perspective because you've seen like um, Amazon kind of services in other parts of uh, uh, of this world. I think we have seen Noon uh, growing a lot here in the in the last year. So. From a consumer perspective, are you able to order everything, uh, whatever you like, uh, with the same day, same hour kind of delivery um, cycle to your home, or is it still limited? No, no, it's, it's, it's now most of the markets in GCC and MENA region, especially if you look at the mature markets like UAE, Qatar, Egypt, KSA. Now, the likes of Noon, Amazon, uh, who are doing a fantastic job. Along with the pure players, we have also seen a number of the omnichannel players who have also stepped up the game, like my previous company, Kafu, uh, which also does one hour delivery. Um, you have other omnichannel players also doing fast delivery, same day deliveries, next day deliveries. Um, so I think that the market here in GCC, in majority of the countries, it's almost as similar to the Western market or the US market or even the Chinese market. Um, there's still a lot of room to improve. Um, there's definitely the, the, the growth has come in an accelerated manner. So that means a lot of different parts of the functions, including supply chain, including the, the, the fulfillment, the last mile has to grow with it. But they're definitely keeping up with that. The, uh, the main drivers for e-commerce adoption in the Western markets have been uh, price, um, the assortments or the, or the, the much bigger assortment and availability. So and, um, and those drove actually many customers into the e-commerce channels in uh, Germany, France and, and the US. So if I'm looking around here in, in this region, if, I'm, if, if I try to understand the mall culture still where people like meet and eat and try to spend time, I'm not sure if these are the same uh, uh, levers to drive e-commerce in, 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 in the region. What are the levers from your point of view? Um, look, uh, the, the, the consumer perspective, uh, I truly believe what consumers want in terms of the product availability price is no difference to any other part of the world. It's still the same here. Uh, recently, I've been doing a, a quite a in-depth studies in Iraq, which is probably the least mature e-commerce uh, country in, uh, in GCC. The study clearly shows the number one to number three problem, it's about product availability, price, and the range for yeah. them to access. So no matter who the consumer is in any part of the world, this hasn't really changed. This is the same. Now, the conception about the malls and versus uh, people like to go to malls and people buying online. Look, I think there's a misconception around that. Yeah? Um, one, if you compare in Berlin, you know, people like to go to the Mao Park, right? People like to go to, uh, in the, to the parks, to the lakes. 
the difference is here, you don't really able to go to those areas because of the heat and etc. So the alternative people do go to the malls. Malls here are not really only for shopping. Malls are built towards entertainment. Uh, if you go to Mall of Emirates, you have the Ski Dubai, you have Kids Play area. So the malls is beyond just in the shopping or trading perspective. So the online shopping, it's still something that customers do look for. Because consumer behavior in terms of researching online for, for the electronic goods, electronic products or fashion, is no difference to any other part of the world. So people do start researching in online even here. They probably will end up going to the store and buying it in the store or testing it in the store, which is still the same. Yeah. So I think the only difference malls here are built not only for the, the, the commerce perspective, but also for the entertainment perspective. And that's the biggest misconception. Okay, but um, if, if, if we're looking about the, um, the rise and fall of malls or in general like brick and mortar environments in the, in the Western country, we saw that um, this kind of e-commerce um, uh, pricing scheme, uh, which, which in general actually led to lower prices in the online shops, led to a situation where many brick and mortar retailers with the horizontal business models, so without exclusive um, uh, um, uh, merchandise, uh, but with merchandise they're just buying from um, brands, they had a big problem because they, they, they had to um, decrease their prices to a level that they could not afford the brick and mortar infrastructure anymore. So the, the, the rent was too expensive. The personal costs were too expensive. And if I'm looking even at the mall infrastructure here, so it seems very pricey. Okay, I've just have been to the Dubai mall. That's maybe an exception uh, here. But uh, um, is, is it all already driving the prices down in the mall, the e-commerce adaption here in the Middle East? And that's a good question, Alex. I think Dubai Mall is built for, for some people yeah, no, from Berlin. Yeah. Huh? So <laughs> that's a different case. Um, now, look, we, we've seen the, the rise and the fall of the brick and mortar, but also we have seen the rise again of brick and mortar in the US and in China and also in the, in, in the European countries. Now, the European countries and the Western market has learned the pricing mechanism. They have had a longer period to understand and figure out, figure out what is the right mechanism for the pricing structure and how to keep that balance. And I think the likes of Walmart and Tesco uh, started testing around having a different prices for online, different prices for offline. Same goes to Macy's, same goes to uh, Target and et cetera. And they've tried the same pricing on both mechanisms. So they keep trying on the different models. And ultimately now, most of the e-commerce platforms outside of the GCC markets have figured out a solid working model that makes sure the unit economics that can work on both sides. Because customers, even if you look at the recent data of US, After the COVID one year of the pandemic going slowly down the trend, people want to go back to, to the stores. Yeah, so people still want to go back to the experience, to the touch and the feel and everything else. Um, and that probably is slightly delayed, but GCC countries are catching up in terms of the okay. e-commerce versus offline. Uh, the pricing mechanism, what's the right pricing structure between online and offline is continually is being the biggest debate for e-commerce players. Of course, learning from the past and learning from the other players at the Western market to see how to get the right unit economics there. And so it's not about just having the same products on both sides. E-commerce players are now looking into having a bulkier product online at a different price, so you cannot compare it. But there are categories like electronic categories where you cannot really uh, avoid it, right? Online is going to drive the price. Okay. Yeah. Now you have proven already you have, um, you have a lot of expertise in that market. And obviously, you're bringing lots of ex expertise uh, with your like, uh, rocket history into that market. M maybe can elaborate a bit on your uh, recent journey as, uh, with uh, Wajid al Futen, though, Because with this kind of expertise, you, you've probably selected the right business model, the right niche, and the right lever in, into that market. So I would be very interested to hear from you. What do you see there as an e-commerce future? Sure. So I recently left as a CDO at uh, Wajid al Futen Retail uh, in May this year. Uh, but I was there for three years, uh, three plus years. And um, look, I don't think I got everything right. We did try a lot of things. We got some things right. We got many things wrong, uh, which is good. We still learned from it, right? I think the pricing definitely drove a lot of topic there. Now, it's not about the pricing or so. I think it's the phase of the companies. Uh, you talked about Rocket, my experience with Rocket. When we launched a lot of the Rocket companies, they are not what it is today. When we launched Jumia, Lazada, there were no other e-commerce com com companies around. So we were able to play towards growth mechanism. And that was the right strategy at the time. Now, perhaps we won't do that the same thing. So in Mouth, we understood that. We also had a different phases. We had a phase that we, we need to grow online. We need to grow the market share. We need to grow the sales penetration within our group. So that has a different phase. Then we had a phase during, after that, how do we now scale more 
with the profitability or sustainably over the long term. What does that mean? How do we balance between our brick and mortar? How do we manage, look at customers, not just for online and offline, look yeah. at customers as a whole. I think, I think that's the key. If you look at customer lifetime value, you can look at it just for online channel or you look at offline channel or you look at both and trying to figure out what can we drive from there and how to set customer expectation and our expectation based on that. And I think that's the biggest learning that we've understood. Um, there are still a lot of fundamental challenges that needs to support this case to scale product availability. It's regardless of a company. I think global supply chain is a major issue right now. That does have an impact on product availability, customer experience, pricing, and et cetera. But then how do you de-risk that? How do you bring other perspective to that? I think it's a key. Yeah, and, and you refer to like the uh, rocket expansion uh, time where like online marketing and all this kind of growth mechanisms were like a central driver. Yeah. If, if you would do like a bottleneck analysis today in this market, so what is the bottleneck when it comes to e-commerce growth in the Middle East or especially maybe the Dubai region? Is it, is it talent? Is it warehouse uh, space? Is it delivery capacity? Is it supply chain uh, issue? So where, where is the bottleneck? So the bottleneck is actually in a number of different places. Yeah, I think the, 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 the misconception in when it comes to e-commerce, people tend to think it's the technology or the e-commerce platform. Uh, it's, it's not that, to be very honest. It's not that. You know, we have the likes of Sprikers and many other platforms that are now readily available. Uh, if you have the, the, the technology piece, probably the easiest problem to solve among all the other bottleneck that we see. Of course, it has to be supported with a very strong talent. I think in the market here in MENA, we're still struggling to get the right market. Now, uh, right talent, sorry. So that means companies have to adopt. Companies have to understand how to now utilize this globalization, how to have teams in different places, but how to have the right leaders to be able to identify the right framework, make the right decision, make the right team structures in different parts of the world or here. And I think that's the key. That's the first bottleneck that many of the companies are still struggling with. Second part is supply chain. I mean, supply chain, it's, uh, it's either, it's the same situation either in Canada, in US, in UK, in Germany, or in, in here. Now, de definitely the global issue impacts that. But there is a way that to understand how to accelerate in terms of demand forecasting, sales forecasting, in terms of product identification, in terms of going to more, more private label, owning more products, in terms of more partnership with the larger FMCG companies to identify how to predict this better and how to have them better. I think the, the, the region is doing fairly well in terms of, uh, in terms of last mile and warehousing. You, you can also see perhaps in Seamless, there are quite a number of last mile and, and warehouse as a service organization now popping up. And I think all that is helping the ecosystem to accelerate and to de-risk that bottleneck is on that place. And I think the organization have to focus on the talent, having the right talent from the top till the bottom and having the right supply chain in place that will solve majority of our customer experience issues. Yeah, later today we have uh, uh, one uh, one supplier of this free zone um, um, set up here in Dubai and there's like, I've seen more than 40 free zones are here uh, available. Uh, what is this concept about? Are you also located with your new business in a, such a free zone? We actually, yes, we do. We do have an office in free zone, primarily for cross-border. So we can have products coming in from uh, Turkey, from China, and we can import the product to other, export to the other countries as well. But uh, that's a very good example. I mean, infrastructure in terms of warehousing and uh, last mile, perhaps warehousing is a bit more mature. It's growing faster. Last mile due to the bottleneck around, uh, around availability of riders. Of course, the, the fuel price rising, continuous rising fuel price for the last six months is slightly hammering that, slowing that down. But I have no doubt that uh, infrastructure perspective, e-commerce availability will be okay and will be solid. It's more about before that and after that. Okay, and I'd like to pick your brain when it comes to the competition about Noon and um, Amazon, because if we're looking into other markets, so Amazon was like the, when they entered a new market, especially in early phases, they became, uh, became like a quasi-monopoly uh, within a couple of years. Now I've seen here uh, um, Noon uh, was a, a, a startup, I don't know how old it is, a couple of years, but it's now fairly on par with Amazon, maybe even faster. So if you would have to bet, on one, uh, uh, one, one supplier. Is it Amazon or Noon who's winning here, this region? <laughs> I, I don't think I'm going to go into that. Uh, you know, I have to stay here after you leave. Huh? Yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> that's not the right thing to do for me. But look, uh, I don't think it's, uh, there's a need for one winner. Uh, in, in Germany, we had a very good uh, case. I mean, a couple of years ago, a few years ago, between MediaMarkt and Amazon, yeah. there, was a, there was a similar discussion. Is MediaMarkt going to survive uh, with all the stores? And they were ramping up e-commerce slowly in the electronics category while Amazon is coming there. But if you look at today, MediaMarkt is doing not too bad. 
and Amazon also selling electronic categories. So there doesn't need to be a single winner. And I think the categories, the vast majority of the categories can have multiple players focused on different areas. Noon has done a tremendous job in the market. They've been the first mover in the market. Since Amazon come in, unlike in the other markets where Amazon has come in and been very aggressive from day one, we haven't seen that here. But I think they also have a much more sustainable uh, growth here, which is also nice to see. And uh, I think that it improves the overall ecosystem as well in terms of suppliers, in terms of marketplace uh, distributors, which also educates them be better. Yeah, and then, and then Noon and other players can also benefit out of that. Vice versa from Noon as well. Yeah. So I think there's no need for just one winner, especially for, for consumers. It's better to have choices. Um, so I, I, I would bet both companies will continue to grow and do very well as well. What we're seeing in Europe is now that uh, many, many strong retailers are trying to become a platform. And this kind of platform game starts with uh, 500 million, a billion in revenues, because then you have like enough capacities on the online marketing side, on the uh, technology side, on the, uh, you're actually bringing enough like customer potential to uh, merchants on your, on your platform. So how far away are we from this kind of turning point here in that region? Because I understand that there are some pure players around, but, but not as big like as a billion or two billion in, in revenue, which seems to be like the entry level to become a platform. So I think a marketplace uh, or platform here has been a silent, but there are there. Even the Lucas at Kafu and my previous company, 65% of the non-food sales penetration came from marketplace in Kafu. And this is something will be a news for most people. Most people, when they think about Kafu, they think, 100% retail owned, 100% owned product. But in fact, there are, if I'm not mistaken, about two, 300,000 SKUs that comes from marketplace sellers. And that's from, I think, 800 to 1,000 sellers. Yeah. And that's contributed to close to 65%. And I think during Black Friday, it has gone as high up 75% sales penetration that has come from marketplace. Now, Kafu is not a pure player. Kafu is, a, is, yeah. a, is an omnichannel player, right? And brick and mortar player. So there are existing omnichannel players that are also looking at the platform products. There are other services like ride-hailing businesses, food delivery businesses, which is probably not a surprise, that have also opened up the platform now to become more of a platform product to small shops, to small restaurants, to independent stores, dark stores, and etc. So it's growing quite tremendously. If you, if you would advise founders in the European markets who are looking now for the next e-scooter startup or fast delivery service or ultra-fast delivery service like Gorillas & Co., would you advise them to go into that region here to start something new because they have some competitive advantage knowledge-wise and maybe network-wise? Or is it a really tough environment to start something new? Look, for those exact examples, my honest opinion would be look away. Uh, if you're not solving a real problem, if you're not solving a, a real consumer issues and bring innovative problems, innovative solutions for the problems that exist, I don't recommend coming in just because it's ultra, ultra fast, or it's another mobility startup. And I, I don't think that's going to fly anymore. Yeah. It, probably a couple of people have tried, even in the Q-commerce, during 2020 to 2021, there was about 24 Q-commerce startups in, in, in the region itself. Here? Yeah, in the region. Yeah. Today, if you look at it, you probably have four or five, right? That is running very well. And out of those 24, many of them did come here from Berlin, did come here from UK, did come here from Moscow, just for the sake that we'd have a better technology. But to be very frank with you, technologies and operations has become commodity. Yeah, and, and, and many of those systems are available for the same companies here and startups here, and they're quickly adapting to it. So my advice for startup founders in, in other parts of the world, GCC is a great market, MENA is a great market to come, but come solve a real problem. Come be part of the ecosystem. And I think... That would work for me. What is the overall e-commerce market share in the region right now? So at the moment, the e-commerce market share is about 25%, depending on the categories. But uh, overall, it's about 25%. Obviously, if you look at categories like electronic and, uh, and uh, uh, um, fashion, the number goes higher. But when you include grocery into that, overall, it's about 25 to 35%. And apart from the ultra-fast uh, grocery delivery, uh, have there been any trends in the last like two, three years we haven't seen in the other part of the world? Something where we said, okay, that's, that's only possible here in uh, Dubai or Abu Dhabi. <laughs> in e-commerce world? Yeah. In the e-commerce world, look, uh, I think the, the adoption of fast delivery outside of grocery, which is still not very trendy in, in the European or Western market, yeah. is much higher here. Uh, you can definitely now order in fashion 
e-commerce platform, but also luxury e-commerce platform where even WhatsApp chats and you get it same day or next day. Yeah, I'm talking about ultra luxury. Yeah. So that is something which is, will work in Dubai, probably not somewhere else. But outside of e-commerce, I think the, 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 the trend in um, digital startups, especially in fintech, and educational tech is also something which is very low profile, but we see the last couple of years growing very fast. And I think it's, it's, it's a great, great to see that. Nala, thank you for your time. Very insightful uh, comments here. I will follow up on the Noon versus Amazon discussion, maybe outside of this podcast. Maybe we get a, a, a different view here. Uh, but thank you and a bit applause here for Nala. Thank you.